Good morning. Welcome to our second medical education grand rounds for the academic year. My name is Rose Kim. I'm the Assistant Dean for Faculty Affairs, and I'm pleased to introduce to you Dr. Stephen Treziak. Dr. Treziak is a professor of medicine and the interim chair of the Department of Medicine at CMSRU. He is also the medical director of the Adult Health Institute at Cooper University Healthcare. Dr. Treziak is a practicing intensivist and an NIH-funded clinical researcher with more than 100 publications in the scientific literature, primarily in the fields of resuscitation science and critical care. Dr. Treziak received his undergraduate degree from the University of Notre Dame. He went on to earn his medical degree from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, as well as a master's in public health at the University of Chicago, uh, University of Illinois at Chicago. He completed his combined internal medicine and emergency medicine residency training at the University of Illinois at Chicago Medical Center. And from there, he completed his fellowship training in critical care medicine at Rush University Medical Center. He's, board, he's quadruple board certified in internal medicine, emergency medicine, inter, uh, critical care medicine, and neurocritical care. Today, Dr. Treziak will be presenting on the topic of compassionomics and the scientific evidence in support of this emerging field. Dr. Treziak has been an invited TEDx speaker at the University of Notre Dame, as well as the University of Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania on this compelling topic. Please join me in extending a warm welcome to Dr. Treziak. Good morning. I want to thank uh, Dr. Kim and, of course, Dr. Raboli for the invitation to be here today. Uh, and to all of you for coming, anybody that might be watching on live stream, I also want to acknowledge Dr. Ed Viners here. And uh, uh, certainly this topic uh, is really been nurtured by the, uh, by the support of the Center for Humanism here at CMSRU. Uh, and it's a pleasure uh, to be here to speak with you today. Um, so uh, really, my, the aim of today's talk is to answer or to address one question. And whether you are a CMSRU student, a faculty physician, a surgeon, uh, a primary care physician, a nurse, Anything that touches any corner of healthcare, uh, this question, I believe, in my opinion, this is relevant to you. And the question is this Does compassion really matter? Now, I don't mean this in an ethical sense, because I would hope that most people in the room agree that compassion matters. We have a moral imperative. We ought to treat patients with compassion. But today, I'm not talking about the ought. I'm not trying to make a sentimental case uh, or an emotional one. Rather, I want to ask this question from a scientific perspective. What is the evidence that compassion, and specifically compassion for patients, matters? So when I was a student at the University of Wisconsin, I remember quite clearly my dean telling me that they were going to teach me the art and the science of medicine, both. They were completely separate and distinct. But is this paradigm, is this classical paradigm really true? Or are there pieces of the art of medicine that also have evidence-based effects belonging in the science of medicine? And more importantly, what is the evidence? And that's exactly what I'm going to be speaking to today. So any um, research endeavor begins, of course, with a hypothesis. A hypothesis is a statement of the nature of things based on limited evidence as a jumping off point for future investigation. 
and specifically the hypothesis that I want to, uh, to uh, submit to you today is that compassion matters. It matters for patients, for patient care, and for those who care for patients. And so today I'm going to show you a lot of data. I'm going to have to show it to you rather quickly. It is being recorded, so if you want to go back at a later time and pull out some of the detail and look at the papers and dive into them, you certainly can because it'll be recorded. So I'm going to have to move rather quickly. But specifically today, the hypothesis that I want to um, submit to you is that compassion matters in not just meaningful ways, but also in measurable ways. Now there are people, including people in this room, that think that this is absolutely preposterous. Preposterous. In fact, a good friend, esteemed colleague, and respected faculty member suggested this to me about five minutes ago before I began to speak. I welcome that, okay, because we need to test uh, our hypotheses in rigorous ways, and it needs to stand up to that kind of rigor. So I'm going to show you data today, and you can make up your own mind. And then I'm also going to show you some of the things that we're doing in our research program uh, in the Center for Humanism uh, that are actively testing these hypotheses today. Uh, this is a CME talk, so of course I need to give disclosures. So first of all, I have an ethical conflict of interest. I believe that compassion matters. Now, not an intellectual conflict of interest, because that's different. I have an ethical conflict of interest in the sense that even if there were no data, I believe that compassion matters. An intellectual conflict of interest would be that I believe that it matters in measurable ways, and one can't have that kind of bias if you're going to go into a scientific program. So I don't have an intellectual conflict of interest, but I do believe that compassion matters for other reasons. The other disclosure I'll make is that in uh, collaboration with my colleague, Dr. Mazzarelli, we're developing a book uh, that is expected uh, to be published in 2019. All proceeds from that book will be donated back to this campus to support uh, this research mission. So do we have a problem? Do we have a problem with compassion? So on February 27th, 2007, on this highway that was in a town just outside of Uppsala, Sweden, two buses that were packed with passengers collided head on. One of the buses, as you can see, was literally sheared in half. And so you can imagine what the scene was like, both at the scene of the accident as well as at the hospital. Six people died tragically, but miraculously, 56 people were saved. But five years later, researchers asked the question, what do survivors remember? What do survivors remember? So they interviewed every survivor, and using a rigorous qualitative research methodology, they found two common themes in what they remembered. One was expected. It was the pain that they felt at the moment of impact, of course. But the other theme, a lack of compassion from the caregivers at the hospital. But what was striking about it is they were taken to three different trauma centers and they all had the same experience. These data began to open my eyes to a stark reality. In healthcare, I believe that we have a compassion crisis. Now, one could argue that perhaps we just have a compassion crisis in society in general and it bleeds over into healthcare. That may be true, that's a different question for a different day. But in healthcare, there's also evidence of a compassion crisis. So for example, a Harvard study published in Health Affairs, which is one of the most um, uh, prestigious health policy journals in the world, found that almost half of patients believe that the US healthcare system is not compassionate. Interestingly, physicians said the exact same thing. And patients believe that nearly half, nearly half of patients believe that healthcare providers are not compassionate. 
Another uh, large um, survey study found that 66% of patients have had a meaningful healthcare experience with a distinct lack of compassion. By the way, this is not a US phenomenon. So there are similar data from the National Health Service in the UK. There are also similar data from Ireland. When measured very precisely in the context of a physician's office practice, research from the University of Chicago funded by the a by, um, Agency for Health Research and Quality found that compassion comprises less than 1% of physician statements to patients. There is also striking evidence that physicians miss 60 to 90 percent of opportunities for compassion. So what's an opportunity for compassion? The patient makes a statement about how they're struggling and the physician just blows right through it without acknowledging or, or following on. 60 to 90 percent, and this is true both in or in, in wide-ranging specialties, hospital medicine, cancer care, even in primary care. And this is supported by research from University of Chicago, UC San Diego, Duke, funded by the NIH, and they find a common theme over and over again. And this is one precisely measured by either trained observers or by audio and video recording, 60 to 90 percent. We also recognize that we're in the midst of a burnout epidemic in healthcare. I'll briefly talk about that later. But a burnout epidemic, and one of the cornerstones of burnout is depersonalization. What's that? Depersonalization is the inability to make a personal connection. And we have data that that is now an, of epidemic proportions in healthcare. And it's compounded by the fact that rigorous research shows that when precisely measured, physicians spend more time now looking into computer screens than looking patients in the eyes. Based on all of these data, I submit that we are in the midst of a compassion crisis indeed. So this is a classical painting uh, that most, many or most of you are familiar with, the doctor. Um, this doctor is completely locked in, right? There isn't anything that could take his focus off of his patient. And it was that compassion and that attention to this young girl that, was, that moved the family so much that they commissioned this painting. It's a striking, um, it's a striking painting. I'm going to contrast that for one minute with a different work of art. So this was published in JAMA just a few years ago. And this was uh, submitted by uh, a physician who was completely blown away when given this work of art. That was drawn by one of his patients, who's the girl here on the table. That's his sister, that's her sister, this is her mom. So who's this? So that's a physician. Where's the physician looking? This way. What's a physician doing? Typing on the keyboard. That's what the young girl thought a doctor did. So what's the difference here? Completely locked in, can't take the focus off the patient. That's how, that's how people used to represent physicians. And now we're having a different experience. So I gave you the data that there's a compassion crisis. To me, this speaks volumes as well. So this is what we're going to cover. We're going to talk about healthcare outcomes. What's the evidence that compassion matters for healthcare outcomes? Does compassion really matter for healthcare economics? And does healthcare or does compassion really matter for the resilience of those who take care of patients? So patients, patient care, those who care for patients. That's what we're going to talk about today. The methodology that I used in preparing this talk uh, was systematic review. So uh, I'm not going to go through all the details of the methodology of the systematic review, but in, in total, I reviewed more than 1,000 scientific abstracts, uh, more than 200 full-length research manuscripts. And today, is, I, I want to just be clear about one thing, that 
I'm not presenting to you what I think. And I'm not presenting to you what I believe. I'm just presenting to you what I found after reviewing more than 1,000 scientific abstracts and more than 250 research papers in total. I also ought to make one uh, important uh, statement just to be clear. The number one determinant of healthcare outcomes is clinical excellence. Okay? So I'm going to say that again. The number one determinant of healthcare outcomes is clinical excellence. If you botch a surgery, or you're a physician who prescribes the wrong antibiotic that's not covered, uh, that, that they, uh, uh, doesn't cover the organism, uh, there's no amount of compassion that's going to make up for that. Your patient's going to suffer a bad outcome. But all other things being equal, does compassion really matter? And what is the evidence? Nomenclature, of course, is important. And here are two terms that are often used interchangeably, empathy and compassion. I'm going to try to make a distinction for you. Empathy is the mirroring or understanding of another's emotions, so the emotional experience of another's feelings. Compassion, though, is different. It's the emotional response to another's pain or suffering involving an authentic desire to help. So empathy is the feeling component. Compassion is action. And there are actually neuroscience underpinnings to these definitions. So in studies using functional MRI, when one experiences another's pain, sees another, another, another person in pain, and um, it hits in an area of the brain that is associated with pain. It essentially lights up in the pain centers of the brain. But, but when one is focused on compassion for others, a completely separate and distinct neural structure is activated, and it is the one that is associated with affiliation and positive affect. So empathy, the feeling component, actually hurts, whereas compassion, the action component, actually can heal. It counteracts the effects that are painful. So whenever considering uh, of benefits for health outcomes, you have to ask yourself the question, what's the mechanism? Or what are the mechanisms? Our research group published a paper on this, uh, a, a product of a systematic review uh, last year, and we identified more than 20 distinct potential mechanisms of action for that are beneficial to patients. So for example, some are just practical. So if you care deeply about patients, you're more likely to be meticulous about their care, perhaps have fewer medical errors. There are also physiological effects. So compassion for others can actually activate the parasympathetic nervous system. It can counteract stress-mediated disease. There are immune system effects. It can modulate a patient's perception of pain. We'll, we'll look at some endocrine effects. Neuroendocrine system can be activated. But there are also psychological effects counteracting depression, counteracting anxiety, counteracting emotional distress. And lastly, would be a category that I call self-care. How patients take care of themselves. How you motivate people to take better care of themselves. And specifically, the most tangible evidence of that is in adherence to medications. Where there's evidence that if you care deeply about patients and they feel that, they're more likely to take their medicine. So in, we're, we're first going to look at patient safety, so quality of care. In quality of care, what we typically track are complications, so things that are bad. So evidence that would support the hypothesis that compassion is, really matters in healthcare quality would be evidence that absence of compassion is associated with bad things. So I'm going to show you some of that data now. And like I said, I'm going to be moving rather quickly through all these data, but they'll be available to you uh, after the talk. So this is a study from JAMA in 2006. This is a Mayo Clinic study in, done in, uh, conducted in resident physicians. And they measured uh, uh, compassion of the patients. And one thing I also want to mention is, is in making the distinction between empathy and compassion definitions, sometimes they're used rather interchangeably. But in this systematic review, any time that 
what they were measuring matched up with our definition of compassion that we're using uh, for this talk, which is uh, the, emotion, the response to another's pain or suffering involving an authentic desire to help. I'll use the term compassion, where the authors of the study might use the word empathy, but we're actually talking about the same thing, okay? So they measured compassion of the resident physicians and subsequently followed them over the next 90 days to see if they made major medical errors. And what they found was that low compassion was associated with a higher incidence of making a major medical error, self-reported that is, over the next 90 days. This is another study from the same group at the Mayo Clinic testing a couple of the, L, testing the association between burnout and medical errors. And specifically, I wanna draw your attention to two of the cornerstones of burnout. Depersonalization, which we said was the inability to make a personal connection, and emotional exhaustion, which is a precursor to compassion fatigue. Both of these were significantly associated with the subsequent um, uh, major medical errors, self-reported. But what's important is that these odds ratios that you see are for just one point on the scale. So if you go from low depersonalization category to high, you actually have a 50% higher uh, odds of committing a major medical error. These, these are data, uh, again, from the Mayo Clinic, but in conjunction with the American College of Surgeons, a cross-sectional study where they found higher emotional exhaustion and higher depersonalization was associated with higher major errors among U.S. surgeons. This is a study uh, from the University of Washington, which found that high depersonalization among resident physicians in internal medicine was associated with suboptimal care so what was the suboptimal care that they self-reported? Basically cutting corners, Discharge, discharging patients before they were ready just to decrease the census and the workload for the physicians, skipping diagnostic tests prior to discharge, and even admitting that from a humanistic perspective that they didn't do the right thing. These are all the things that they literally wrote in. Um, a five times higher odds for those that have depersonalization. And obviously, this is a major determinant of the quality of care. But these are processes. What about outcomes? Well, a study from the National Science Foundation, this, the Swiss National Science Foundation, they found that emotional exhaustion, which is an important precursor to compassion fatigue, was associated with more deaths in the ICU setting. I should also mention to you that along with the compassion crisis, there's evidence from the uh, NIH-sponsored study from the University of Washington that found that in the ICU setting, in the context of end-of-life decisions, fully 33% of end-of-life decisions with patients or families in the ICU have no expression of compassions from the physicians. And I think that's rather striking, being an intensivist myself. So this is a study from way back in 1963, published in JAMA. And this is a study, a randomized control trial from Harvard conducted at Mass General, in which they randomized uh, surgical patients to one of two arms. One is conventional care, the other is what they called special care. And in what they called the special care arm, they got a special additional preoperative visit from the anesthesiologist. And that was rooted in human connection, building rapport, compassion, and allaying a patient's concerns prior to surgery. What they found in this randomized control trial uh, where they, um, they were actually testing human connection versus one of the study arms was pentobarbital. What they found was that patients that got pentobarbital were drowsy, but they weren't calm. But patients who got the special care visit from the anesthesiologist were calm, but they weren't drowsy. This actually dovetails with uh, the experience over 30 years, I believe, from my colleague, Dr. Selena, who let me know that when he, he, he'll never give up his busy clinical practice. And one of the key reasons is because he's seen the power of that human connection at the bedside. And what he tells me is that when he's able to connect with a patient prior to surgery, he finds that they need less benzodiazepines. Makes sense when you look at this data from JAMA way back in 1963. The same investigators published another study in the New England Journal of Medicine 
another study of special care intervention from the anesthesiologist, and they found a 50% lower postoperative opiate analgesia requirement. Again, human connection can modulate a patient's perception of pain. And there, are, um, there is abundant experimental data on that fact. Let's move to uh, diabetes. So our colleagues from Jefferson published a couple of studies, I'll show you in the next two slides, in diabetes patients. And what they found was that high physician compassion, this is actually measured from the physician's perspective. So they did an assessment of what the physician's values were. Now, of course, if the physician doesn't value compassion, probably they don't treat patients that way, right? What they found is that high physician compassion was associated with 80% higher odds of blood glucose control and optimal LDL cholesterol control. But does this actually result in better outcomes? So they took this same methodology and went all the way to Parma, Italy. Why? Because there's a National Health Service there, and they were able to use that to leverage, leverage that large scale um, in order to test it in 20, more than 20,000 diabetic patients. And what they found was that high physician compassion was associated with lower odds of acute metabolic complications, specifically hospitalizations for DKA. So does compassion really matter in low back pain? So this is a study from the physical therapy um, field. Obviously, the number one reason for missing work in the U.S. is low back pain. What they found in this randomized controlled trial is that randomization to compassion, meaning both verbal and nonverbal um, uh, communications compared to standard care was associated with lower pain as reported by the patients by a validated pain scale, but also less tenderness in the lower back muscles as measured with a calibrated technique that is just standard for how you measure muscle tenderness in patients with low back pain. Does compassion really matter in irritable bowel syndrome? So this is a Harvard study published in the BMJ in 2008. In each of these panels, going from left to right, you see controls who are randomized to a wait list versus what they consider to be standard care versus augmented doctor-patient relationship. So obviously, irritable bowel syndrome is really difficult to treat if you're a gastroenterologist. It can be really challenging. What they did in the limited arm of this study is they actually used acupuncture, which has been shown to be efficacious. But in the augmented doctor-patient relationship, they specifically had uh, a, um, a methodology for both verbal and nonverbal communications for compassion with the patients, such as, I can imagine how hard irritable bowel syndrome must be for you, and statements like that. What they found in this Harvard study published in the BMJ, a randomized control trial, so this is a bona fide experiment, is that patients randomized to augmentation of human connection had a doubling, if you look at the upper right panel, doubling of patients uh, that had adequate relief of symptoms. How about immune system effects? So in patients with the common cold, this is a University of Wisconsin study supported by a research grant from the NIH. What they found is that high physician compassion as rated by the patient was associated with an increase in uh, or uh, immune system enhancement as measured by interleukins in their nasal, nasal washings, one day decrease in cold duration and 15% decrease in symptom severity. This is in the common cold. A National Science Foundation study, and by the way, the National Science Foundation doesn't really do much healthcare research, all right? So that's, that's the level of rigor that these investigators brought. This is a Harvard and Stanford collaboration examining physical therapy in geriatric patients admitted to the hospital. So if, when geriatric patients are admitted to the hospital, they often need a lot of help to get ready to go back home and live independently. What they found, what these investigators found after recording the physical therapy sessions is that when physical therapists had distancing behavior, meaning large physical distance, no eye contact, lack of facial expression, no touch, 
patients had worse physical, cognitive, and psychological functions. On the contrary, when they had, when they had closeness, eye connection, facial expression, uh, expressiveness, uh, patients had better outcomes in all of these domains. Psychological effects. Um, does compassion really matter for psychological outcomes? In patients with depression, this is a University of Pennsylvania study, in patients with depression, therapist compassion was independently associated with sim depression symptom resolution, and this is after adjustment for the severity of depression symptoms. This is a study um, that synthesized 39 different studies from the oncology uh, field and found that high clinician compassion was associated with lower distress, both emotional and psychological distress in cancer patients. And if you're a cancer patient, it's probably a pretty important outcome. Uh, importantly, compassion is also associated with full, is getting your prescription filled. So perhaps that's the mechanism by which depression symptoms might be alleviated at least to, to some extent. This is a University of Colorado study sponsored again by the NIH. So this is a Johns Hopkins study in 1,700 patients with HIV. And what they did is they asked patients, does your physician know you as a person? Binary, yes, no. Knowing the patient as a person in these HIV patients was associated with higher odds of being actually uh, prescribed uh, uh, treatment that is uh, consistent with consensus recommendations, more likely to believe that your therapy is going to work, and 33% higher odds of adherence to antiretroviral therapy. So if you care deeply about patients and they know that, they're more likely to take their medicine. But what's the evidence? So what if they took their medicine? Well, there was also a 20% higher odds of having undetectable virus in the blood. So knowing your patient as a person can matter in a multitude of ways. So I'm gonna move through economics rather quickly, uh, but clearly this, this could be a talk in and of itself. Um, what do patients really want? Having a lot of experience and training in one of the best medical schools sound pretty important to me. They probably sound pretty important to you. But if you ask people what they want, this is a Pew Research study published in the Wall Street Journal uh, many years ago. This is what they want. Now, this might be surprising to you that it's the human connection aspects that they're really looking for. Let, let me show you another uh, survey. In a survey of 1,400 patients, the number one was kindness and compassion. 72% say they would pay more for compassion. Now, why, why is that? If, if you're like me, the first time you see these data, you might be surprised because I would think my patients want technical expertise. I'll tell you my hypothesis. I just think that patients, in general, think that all doctors know what they're doing. Now, you and I may have different uh, opinions about the level of technical expertise and the different um, uh, variations that there may be there, but from the patient perspective, the data show that human connection is actually what they're looking for. And clearly, this is a major driver of revenues for healthcare organizations. Patient experience drives business. For all you students, um, you probably have to do OSCEs, right? Okay. Well, in the context of, of OSCEs, what has been found is that when uh, physicians in training exhibit compassion towards patients, both the patient and the observer your, your proctor for the examination, your professor, both give higher ratings. In other words, treating patients with compassion makes people believe that you know what you're doing. It is a sign of competence. 
Um, there are a number of studies uh, from the University of Rochester, uh, from UC Davis, uh, that show that compassionate care is associated with fewer diagnostic tests, fewer um, uh, lower total health care spending. Uh, here's another study, fewer referrals to specialists, fewer admissions to the hospital, fewer use of diagnostic tests, lower total medical charges. All of these uh, studies that I'm showing you now in these slides are from the primary care uh, domain. Another study, uh, less likely to undergo diagnostic testing with compassionate patient-centered care, less likely to be referred to a specialist. In this study in the BMJ, primary care patients who didn't get that personal connection that they were looking for had a 41% higher odds of referral to a specialist. This was after con uh, controlling for a number of patient factors, um, including the severity of their illness as well as anxiety. Putting all these data together, if we spend more time connecting with our patients, maybe we don't need so many tests and referrals if we spend more time actually talking to them. But how much time? We're gonna get into that in just one minute. Here's a study uh, of homeless patients in the emergency department setting. This was published in The Lancet, a randomized trial of randomizing homeless patients to either conventional care or a compassion intervention, where literally uh, a student was trained in a methodology to communicate compassion for patients and was posted up at the patient's bedside in the emergency department and did nothing else besides treat them with compassion. What do you think happened? This is the Kappa Meyer curve. They had fewer return visits to the emergency department. So compassion for patients, perhaps in this case, in this experiment, resulted, and this was a randomized trial, compassion for patients was associated with fewer hospital readmissions. Perhaps they just got what they wanted and that's why they didn't need to come back. This is a study from 13 long-term care centers, what some people might call nursing homes, across the Northeast. This is a study that was uh, conducted by uh, Wharton, the Wharton School at University of Pennsylvania. They also found that, a, and, and in this study, they were measuring the culture in these different um, long-term care centers, and they had a validated scale to measure whether or not the culture in the workplace was one of compassion or not, and what they found was that having a workplace culture of compassion was associated with fewer trips to the ER for the residents of the long-term care center, but also better teamwork and the healthcare workers missing work less frequently. Clearly these things can have profound uh, economic impact. This is the number of dollars, um, and I recognize this is a wide range, but this is considering all sources in wh which they've attempted to measure this. This is the number of dollars annually in downstream avoidable healthcare costs that are attributed to non-adherence to prescribed medication. So if compassion for patients can help with non-adherence to medications, perhaps it can move this number as well. Now here is a striking number in my opinion, 56. 56% 56 of physicians report they lack the time to be compassionate to patients. This is a Harvard study. 56%, we don't have enough time. So how much time does it actually take? So in order to address this, researchers from Johns Hopkins University did a randomized control trial in cancer patients, having a consultation with the oncologist, and they randomized to one of two arms. One was conventional care where they just got information. The other arm of the study was randomized to enhanced compassion. And what they found was a distinct, measurable, statistically significant decrease in anxiety amongst the cancer patients. So what was the intervention? So this was their intervention, right here. So at the beginning of the consultation from the oncologist, I know this is a tough experience to go through and I want you to know that I'm here with you. 
Some of the things that I say to you today may be difficult to understand, so I want you to feel comfortable in stopping me if something I say is confusing or doesn't make sense. We're here together, and we will go through this together. And at the end of the consultation, from the oncologist, I know this is a tough time for you, and I want to emphasize again that we're in this together. I'll be with you each step along the way. So how long did that take? So 40 seconds to make a meaningful difference for a patient. So in this systematic review, our research team has found six different studies that have measured this. How long does it take to measure a compassion connection with a patient? And all of them found it was less than one minute. Now there's this concept of time affluence, and this is a study, um, uh, there's some work on this again from the Wharton School about time affluence. That means feeling like you have enough time. So maybe it's just a perception problem on the part of physicians. It's not that we don't have time to be compassionate. We just think we don't have enough time because we're so busy. But when you recognize that the evidence shows it takes less than one minute and you couple it with these data from the Wharton School, which, which they did a series of experiments where people either invested time in others, invested time in themselves, wasted time, or got a windfall of free time that was unexpected, what they found is what impacted time affluence, meaning the feeling that you have plenty of time, was investing time in other people. That's what made you feel that you had enough time. So giving time actually gives you time. And there's, um, there's some rigorous evidence around this. Now I want to move on to resilience, but this dovetails with economics. Because uh, research from Stanford University, just published last year in JAMA Internal Medicine, found that the costs of replacing a physician uh, who leaves is somewhere between $500,000 and a million dollars. So if we're able to impact burnout in some way, that could have a major effect on the economics of healthcare. We're all aware of the burnout epidemic in medicine. I'm not gonna get into it because you've had already grand round speakers spend a whole hour on this topic. So I'm not gonna do that. But what I wanna do is challenge a, what, I'll, what I think is a myth, okay? So I remember when I started medical school in 1993, the teaching at that time was don't get too close to patients because you might get burned out. Now, if that was true, now I've, I believe that for most of my career until I actually went to the data and looked at the evidence. If that is true, that compassion for patients puts you at risk for burnout, if that was true, then there would be positive associations throughout the literature, meaning high compassion, high burnout. What's actually been found, as, as shown in this meta-analysis that was published last year, is just the opposite. Actually, only 10% of the available studies show a positive association. One, uh, t another 10% shows a mixed uh, picture, but 80% shows quite clearly an inverse association. So that means high compassion, low burnout, low compassion, high burnout. So some people want to just assume or infer causation there. Compassion is crushed by burnout. But these are all cross-sectional studies, so scientifically, that's not a valid uh, results interpretation. What's equally as likely, what's equally as likely, is that those people who have low compassion are those people who are more at risk for burnout under the same level of stress. And so that's my hypothesis. There's some data to support this. Uh, this study from the University of Montreal found that uh, com high compassion is protective against multivariate, um, uh, uh, protective against burnout uh, amongst primary care physicians. Physicians with the most dissatisfaction with their relationships with patients have a much higher odds of experiencing burnout. And in this study, an experimental study, so a randomized controlled trial from Emory University, took medical students and trained them in compassion for patients 
and found that, and by the way, burnout begins early, like we've all heard that before, right? So there was a reduction in depression symptoms amongst those physicians in training that underwent compassion training, and the benefit was the greatest in those who were the most depressed at baseline. So there's something about human connection and learning how to connect with people and having that experience that modulates your own experience and what you're experiencing at the bedside every day. Um, so th this now is where the science meets the personal because since we're among friends, I can share with you. Um, I went through this myself. So I'm an intensivist. Uh, if you're an intensivist, you meet people on the worst day of their life. And uh, after 20 years of doing that, uh, I came to realize I had every symptom of burnout, like every one. So armed with this data, the compassion can be a meaningful intervention for the giver too, I decided to test the compassion hypothesis for myself. And what I will tell you is that changed everything for me. And when I began to focus on connecting with patients and their families in the ICU is when I felt that fog of burnout began to lift. The conventional thinking about burnout is the way to treat it is, is what I like to call escapism. Like just get away, just detach, get away more. But I wasn't buying it because I thought that the, the antidote to burnout has to be at the point of care, not in escaping. So um, this is my experience. If you're going through the same thing, I suggest you uh, test the compassion hypothesis for yourself and see what it does for your experience. So we talked about um, the big question. Does compassion really matter? So I showed you the evidence for the impact on health outcomes, for the impact on health economics, and new emerging data on resilience and how compassion for patients can actually build resilience and counteract the effects of burnout in those who care for patients. So I believe that compassionate care is evidence-based medicine after going through 1,000 scientific abstracts, more than 200 research papers. Uh, I believe that the preponderance of evidence in the biomedical literature supports this. And so this is the paradigm that I showed you earlier, but I think that the available evidence actually suggests that there is science in the art of medicine. And I believe that that science is strong. And that's what our research team uh, in the Center of Humanism here at CMSRU is uh, fully focused on in testing this going forward. So lastly, uh, I'm going to um, ask you the question, can we learn to be compassionate? Now this is a medical education grand rounds and what I would suggest to you is that everything we've reviewed so far, so far is um, completely on point to the topic of medical education. Because if you're a BMS faculty member or you're a clinician teaching students on rounds, what we've talked about today is the context for everything that you teach. But can somebody learn to be compassionate? See, I used to think that this isn't true. You're just either wired for compassion or you're not. You're wired for compassion or I'm not a touchy-feely person. The preponderance of evidence in the biomedical literature actually says change can happen. That compassion can actually be learned. Maybe we're not going to have talk about the existential questions about what one believes in their mind or feels in their mind, but it's all about behaviors. The preponderance of evidence in the biomedical literature shows quite clearly that compassionate behaviors towards other people can, in fact, be learned. Uh, and that is good news indeed. One analogy that's been used is throwing a javelin, okay? If you throw a javelin and you practice every day, you may not become an Olympic javelin thrower. Not everybody has that kind of uh, intrinsic ability. But you can get a little bit better. 
with practice and, and with intentionality. Everybody can improve at least a little bit. Uh, this is a study that was uh, published by a group of investigators from uh, Children's Hospital of Pennsylvania. A systematic review of interventions to raise physician compassion and what they found was that 80% of the studies testing an intervention to raise compassionate behaviors among healthcare providers saw a benefit. Saw a benefit. So the preponderance of evidence says change can happen. This is, a, um, this is a, a, a paper that we just published. This is actually a protocol. This is a methodology uh, that our colleagues in the Center for Humanism here at CMSRU are, uh, are uh, in collaboration with Department of Emergency Medicine, Department of Psychiatry, my department, Department of Medicine. Um, this is how we're approaching uh, compassion training. We want to take the most rigorous approach possible and therefore, we're doing a systematic review to be as evidence-based as we possibly can. Um, the last thing I want to I want to do is I want to just um, say that. Uh, so I, I just gave you a talk on the power of compassion. So you might must think that I'm the most compassionate doctor, right? But the truth, uh, I'm a hundred percent a work in progress. Uh, a work in progress for sure. But the difference is that I see it now. I see it. And I'm working hard to get better at compassion every day. I've had a lot of great mentors. Uh, Phil Dellinger, who just stepped out, uh, Ed Viner, of course, uh, and others uh, in this room. Um, but change is possible, and that is good. That is good news indeed. But then that's the message for any student in this room, you don't need to be board certified to treat a patient with compassion. You don't even have to pass step one. You have the power to do it today, just as effectively as the most senior experienced faculty. You have that power. You are powerful. And in studying this topic, Hopefully you will find that power more and more and want to use it every opportunity that you have. Lastly, I'm going to tell you one powerful story and then I'm going, to, I'm going to close about the power of compassion. It's actually a case report that was published in the literature back in 1985. So a 35-year-old man was admitted to the ICU with ARDS, fighting for his life. Thankfully, he survived but he wasn't strong enough after all of that to breathe on his own. It took a long time. He wondered, am I ever gonna get off this ventilator? If you're a student who hasn't yet rotated in ICU, patients who are in that sort of dependency, it's the most vulnerable a human being can ever be. And this a uh, patient went on in this case report to tell the story about the, 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 the people who saved his life and helped him to get off the ventilator were the nurses. How? Because they cared. He used to say, or he still says to this day, that he could tell within one minute when they had changed a shift if the nurse cared or not. He used to call them his angels. But when he got somebody that didn't care, it broke his spirit, and he thought he was never going to get off the ventilator. He wrote in this paper that he, that he had thoughts of death in his mind. But it was the people who cared deeply that gave him the strength to carry on and get off the ventilator. And so um, that's the power of compassion. The author of this, of this report, Dr. Viner, who's taught me a lot about compassion and still does uh, to this day. Uh, so thanks, many thanks to Ed for all his inspiration. So um, in closing, I just want to thank you all for coming today. Uh, I hope you, you recognize uh, the power that you hold in your hand uh, or that you hold in treating patients with compassion. And uh, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you.